I had a blast working in Walt Disney Studios. See, I was a storyboard artist at Walt Disney for a year. It was 1928, and I had just gotten my degree in animation. It wasn't paid, of course. Most internships aren't. But it did have some perks beyond education. To adults, it might not seem like a big one, but most kids at the time would shit themselves over it. Till things go sour for all of us, anyway. At the time, Disney was feeling the economic pressures of the war at the time. Animators were leaving the studio to join the military. Disney was wrapped up working on propaganda videos for the U.S. government, and their overseas revenue was virtually non-existent due to everything. It was one of the handful of times in the company's history that their future was rocky and uncertain. So, while re-releasing Snow White didn't solve our problems, it... It at least helped. And on top of that, there was a genuine be belief and benefit for the audiences in putting out the film again. Seven years later, there would be a whole new wave of children who had never even seen the film. Now remember, this was now the 40s. There was no Netflix, no Blu-rays, DVDs, or VHS tapes. Okay, TV was still pretty new, and... The industry's relationship with film would be rocky for a while anyway. And I guess this brings me to the reason I'm writing this down. Because there was a certain original plot line for the 1940 second full-length animated feature film, Pinocchio. I first saw the plot line when I first retired when Walt Disney himself died. I went to the vault where we kept all Disney films in alphabetical order, like Walt had promised. Now you might be asking yourselves, what is the Disney vault? You know, is it real? Why does Disney put movies in it? And is it a bad idea? Well, for starters, no, it's not real. But there is an actual Disney vault that houses the animations for some of Disney's most classic animated films. And to my luck, that's where I found it. I found it while cleaning up the place. I saw the letter P and thought of Pinocchio. I actually enjoyed making the film along with my colleagues, since Pinocchio was my favorite fairy tale. I opened the drawer and found the original tape. Then I discovered there was another tape under that one. I saw the words 1937 Pinocchio Original Classic. And it was written on it with black marker. I then quickly realized that it was written in Walt's handwriting. I can easily tell it was written by Walt himself, because, like I said before, I've been working in Walt Disney Studios since the first Mickey Mouse cartoon aired. This is where VHS tapes became a smash hit. So don't get me wrong with something completely off-topic, okay? Uh, anyway, I took the tape and headed home. I pondered at the thought that something was wrong. I'm completely sure. Matter of fact, I'm 100% sure that we didn't make Pinocchio in 37. I was baffled. I thought, we did not make this. And Walter was expecting Snow White to be in theaters, not Pinocchio. I shook my head in disbelief. I mean, it was all I could do. But I knew I had to do some more thinking while eating my McDonald's dinner. After finishing my dinner, I took the tape, put it in my VHS player, and hit the start button. After about a minute of rewinding, that is. While it played some trailers, I grabbed a bottle of Bud and sat down in front of the TV. 
After the usual feature presentation screen with the silhouette of Mickey Mouse spinning, it got to the film. It starts out like the 1940s version, but as soon as I saw the credits, I noticed the names... Phil Thompson, Dennis Harrison, Catherine Smith, and Matthew Sanders. As you know, it begins with Jiminy Cricket singing that Wish Upon a Star song, which became a trademark song for Disney. Hell, it might even be useful for the logo someday. <laughs> uh, after the song had ended, it cuts to Jiminy discussing to the audience about the story. He opens the book, and it goes to a different character who appears to be a lumberjack named Maestro Cherry. He looks like the giant from Mickey and the Beanstalk, except he was voiced by Bill Murray, who did Baloo the Bear in The Jungle Book and Little John in Robin Hood. This character is the same size of a normal man with German clothing, since the film took place in Germany. His nose was red, almost like the painted nose of a clown. He was chopping down trees so that he can carve them into utensils, chairs, tables, or simple boards for houses. Maestro was chopping a pine tree. When he leaves, lightning strikes the tree, imbuing a fallen piece of the tree with magic. He stares at the fallen piece of wood for a moment. Then he thought, and was suddenly filled with joy. Rubbing his hands together happily, he mumbled half to himself, right on time. I'll use this to make the leg for my table. He took it to his house and grasped the hatchet quickly to peel off the bark and shape the wood. But before he could chop it on the right shape, he heard the piece of wood say, Please be careful, don't hit me so hard. It sounded like the same actor who voiced Pinocchio in the 1940 version. At least, I think it was. I could be wrong. I don't remember much, so forgive me for my lack of memory. Frightened by the talking log, Maestro Cherry gives it to his neighbor Geppetto, an extremely poor man who plans to make a living as a puppeteer in hopes of earning, quote, a crust of bread and a glass of wine. Geppetto carves the block into a young boy, and names him Pinocchio. As soon as Pinocchio's nose has been carved, it begins to grow the more he acts like a dummy to Geppetto. Before he is even built, Pinocchio already has a mischievous attitude. No sooner than Geppetto is finished carving Pinocchio's feet does the puppet proceed to kick him in the face. It was actually kind of funny. And once the puppet had been finished, and Geppetto teaches him to walk, Pinocchio runs out the door and away into the town. He is caught by a policeman, who assumes Pinocchio has been mistreated, and imprisons Geppetto. Left alone, Pinocchio heads back to Geppetto's house to get something to eat. Once he arrives at home, a talking cricket, who is actually Jiminy, who has lived in the house for over a century, warns him of the perils of disobedience and hedonism. In retaliation, Pinocchio throws a hammer at the cricket and... and he dies instantly. That evening, Pinocchio falls asleep with his feet on the stove and wakes to find that they have been burned off. Geppetto is released from prison. He proceeds to make Pinocchio a new pair of feet, and in gratitude, Pinocchio promises to attend school, and Geppetto sells his only coat to buy him a school book. On his way to school the next morning, Pinocchio encounters the Great Marionette Theater, and he sells his school book in order to buy a ticket for the show. The marionettes on stage recognize him in the audience and call out to him, angering the puppet master Stromboli. The puppet master initially decides to use Pinocchio as firewood, but ultimately releases him and gives him five gold coins to give to Geppetto. And as Pinocchio travels home to give the coins to his father, 
Well, this is where he meets Honest John and Gideon. Honest John and Gideon appear to be wearing raggedy clothes instead of their usual clothes in the 1940s version. Honest John is seen even more cunning than his usual appearance. Gideon was even stranger. Instead of the usual dim-witted appearance, he's smarter than Honest John himself. He has appeared as a skinny black tabby cat with a chipped right ear. He even has a scar on his face and, to my shock, actually talks in the film. He spoke in a raspy British accent. If you saw Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1941, then Gideon sounds identical to Mr. Hyde. It turns out that Gideon is voiced by the late, great Spencer Tracy. But anyway, back to the film. Gideon pretends to be blind, and Honest John pretends to be crippled. A crow tries to warn Pinocchio of their lies, but the crow is eaten by Gideon. The two anthropomorphic animals convince Pinocchio that if he plants his coins in the Field of Miracles outside the city of Catchfools, they will grow into a tree with gold coins. They stop in an inn, where Honest John and Gideon, at Pinocchio's expense, asks him to be awakened by midnight. Two hours before the set time, the pair abandon Pinocchio, leaving him to pay for room service with one of his coins. Before Gideon leaves with Honest John, he sits next to Pinocchio on the bed and has a conversation with him. He tells Pinocchio to stay inside after dark, and that some masked maniacs attack people around 12. Honest John then calls out to Gideon, and he leaves before looking back, stating with a interesting malevolent looking grin. Can't wait to see you again. They instruct the innkeeper to tell Pinocchio that they left after receiving a message stating that Gideon's eldest kitten had fallen ill, and that they would meet Pinocchio at the Field of Miracles in the morning. They take off ahead of Pinocchio and disguise themselves as bandits, while Pinocchio continues on toward Catch Fools despite warnings from Jiminy. Honest John and Gideon reminded me of two Ku Klux Klan members as they wore these white sheets over their heads as masks and the larger parts as the costumes. Stitches can be seen all over the costumes, showing that they had made the costumes themselves. Two large eye holes are shown on the masks, and the disguised fox and cat ambush Pinocchio, but the puppet escapes to a white house after biting off Gideon's hand. Upon knocking on the door, Pinocchio is greeted by a young fairy with turquoise hair, who says she is dead and waiting for a hearse. Unfortunately, the bandits catch him and hang him in a tree, and after a while, Honest John and Gideon get tired of waiting for the puppet to suffocate, and they leave. The fairy has Pinocchio rescued by summoning a falcon to get him down and having her poodle servant pick him up in her stagecoach. The fairy calls in three famous doctors to tell her whether Pinocchio is dead. Two of them, an owl and a mare, are unsure of Pinocchio's status. The third doctor is the ghost of Jiminy Cricket, who says that the puppet is fine but has been disobedient and has hurt his father. The fairy administers medicine to Pinocchio, who consents to take it after four Undertaker rabbits arrive to carry away his body. Now recovered, Pinocchio lies to the fairy when she asks what has happened to the gold coins, and his nose proceeds to grow until it is so long that he cannot turn around in the room. The fairy explains that Pinocchio's lies are making his nose grow, and calls in a flock of woodpeckers to chisel it down to size. The fairy sends for Geppetto to come and live with them in the forest cottage. When Pinocchio heads out to meet his father, 
he once again encounters Honest John and Gideon. When Pinocchio notices Gideon's missing hand, Honest John claims that they had to sacrifice it to feed a hungry old wolf named Reginald. They remind the puppet of the Field of Miracles, and finally, he agrees to go with them, to plant his gold. They finally reach the city of Catch Fools, where every animal in town has done something exceedingly foolish and now suffer as a result. Upon reaching the Field of Miracles, Pinocchio buries his coins and leaves for the 20 minutes that it will take for his gold to grow into gold coin trees. After Pinocchio leaves, as you'd expect, Honest John and Gideon dig up the coins and run away. Once Pinocchio returns, he learns of Honest John and Gideon's treachery from a parrot who mocks Pinocchio for falling for their tricks. Pinocchio rushes to the Catch Fool's courthouse, where he reports the theft of the coins to a gorilla judge. Although he is irritated by Pinocchio's speech, the judge sentences Pinocchio to four months in prison for the crime of foolishness. Fortunately, all criminals are released early by the jailers when the unseen young emperor of Catch Fools declares a celebration following his army's victory over the town's enemies. Upon being released, Pinocchio leaves Catch Fools. Pinocchio then heads back to the fairy's house in the forest but he sneaks into a farmer's yard to steal some grapes. He is then caught in a weasel trap where he encounters a farmer. He releases Pinocchio from the weasel trap and ties him up in the doghouse of his late watchdog, Malampo, to guard the chicken coop. When Pinocchio foils the chicken-stealing weasels, the farmer frees the puppet as a reward. Pinocchio finally comes to where the cottage was, finds nothing but a gravestone, and believes that the fairy has died of sorrow. A friendly pigeon sees Pinocchio mourning the fairy's death, and offers to give him a ride to the seashore, where Geppetto is building a boat in which to search for Pinocchio. Pinocchio is washed ashore when he swims to his father. Geppetto is then swallowed by a giant megalodon. Pinocchio accepts a ride from a dolphin to the nearest island called the Island of Busy. And upon arriving on the Island of Busy, Pinocchio can only get food in return for labor. Pinocchio offers to carry a lady's jug home in return for food and water. And when they get to the lady house, Pinocchio recognizes the lady as, indeed, the fairy. Now miraculously old enough to be his mother, she says that she will act as his mother, and that Pinocchio will begin going to school. She hints that if Pinocchio does well in school, and tries his hardest to be good for one whole year, then he will become a real boy. So, Pinocchio studies hard, and rises to the top of his class. But this makes the other schoolboys jealous. The other boys trick Pinocchio into playing hooky by saying they saw a large shark at the beach, the same one that swallowed Geppetto. However, the boys were lying, and a fight breaks out. One boy named Eugene is hit by Pinocchio's school book, though Pinocchio did not throw it. He's accused of injuring Eugene by two teachers, but the puppet escapes. During his escape, Pinocchio saves a drowning mastiff named Alidoro. And in exchange, Alidoro later saves Pinocchio from the green fisherman who was going to eat the marionette. After reaching land and going back on the sidewalk, Alidoro then waves goodbye to Pinocchio and says that he's a handsome friend. As Pinocchio returns home, after meeting the snail that works for the fairy, Pinocchio is given another chance by the fairy. Pinocchio proceeds to do excellent in school, passing with high honors. The fairy promises that Pinocchio will be a real boy the next day, and says that he should invite all his friends to a party. He goes to invite everyone, but he is sidetracked when he meets a boy named Candlewick, who's about to go to a place known as Playtime Island, where everyone plays all day and never works. Pinocchio goes along with him, and they are taken there by the coachman and they have a wonderful time for the next 
five months. One morning, in the fifth month, Pinocchio and Candlewick awake with donkey's ears. A dormouse tells Pinocchio that boys who do nothing but play and never work will sometimes turn into donkeys. Soon, both Pinocchio and Candlewick are fully transformed into donkeys, and Pinocchio is sold to a circus by the coachman. He is trained by the ringmaster to do tricks until he falls and sprains his leg. The ringmaster then sells Pinocchio to a man who wants to skin him and make him a drum. The man throws Pinocchio into the sea to drown him. But when the man goes to retrieve the corpse, all he finds is a living marionette. Pinocchio explains that the fish ate all the donkey skin off him, and he is now a puppet again. Pinocchio dives back into the water and swims out to sea. When the Megalodon appears, Pinocchio swims from it at the advice of the fairy in the form of a little blue furred goat from atop a high rock, but is swallowed by it. Inside the Megalodon, Pinocchio unexpectedly finds Geppetto, who's been living on a ship inside the Megalodon. They both manage to escape the giant shark and search for a place to stay. Pinocchio and Geppetto then pass two beggars. It's revealed to be Honest John and Gideon. At this point, Gideon has really become blind, and Honest John has really become crippled, having rips on his jacket. He's gotten rid of his pants because he sold them to a poor family. Honest John and Gideon plead for food or money, but Pinocchio rebuffs them and tells them that their misfortunes have served them right for their wickedness. Geppetto and Pinocchio arrive at a small house, which is home to Jiminy. Jiminy says they can stay and reveals that he got his house from a mountain goat with turquoise hair. Pinocchio gets a job doing work for a farmer and recognizes the farmer's dying donkey as his friend, Candlewick. After long months of working for the farmer and supporting the ailing Geppetto, Pinocchio goes to town with the 40 pennies he has saved to buy himself a new suit. He discovers that the fairy is ill, in need of money. Pinocchio instantly gives the snail he met back on the island of Busy all the money he has, and that night he dreams that he is visited by the fairy who kisses him. When he wakes up, he is a real boy at last. His former puppet body lies lifeless on a chair. Furthermore, Pinocchio finds that the fairy has left him a new suit, new boots, and a bag in which he thinks are the 40 pennies that he originally gave to her. Instead, the boy is shocked to find 40 freshly minted gold coins. Geppetto also returns to health and resumes wood carving. With that, the film ends. I just sat there, eyes bugged out, jaw nearly inches from my crotch, and just stared at the screen. I didn't know the film was truly based on the book I read it as a kid. I mean... The book sends shivers down my spine, and it still does to this day. But now seeing it on my TV screen, it, it, it just makes my blood turn cold. The way the film reverberates from warm-hearted to flat-out dark and ominous, I mean, it makes it hard to pinpoint what was going on. But from what I learned, it's that Walt Disney used to want a much darker tone to Pinocchio. But after knowing this film was going to be seen by children years later, he changed it into the film that we know today as a light-hearted and child-friendly film. I currently sit here, dying from old age. Happens to the best of us. Though I must warn you that Disney has something to hide, and... And it's not just the abandoned Mowgli's palace having living demonic costumes, or what people call today as 
suicidemouse.avi. It's nothing more than a secret we're all supposed to find, but never did. I still have the tape, but I requested that it would be returned to the Disney vault, never to be seen again. Everybody kept asking me for some sort of evidence from the tape, but all I can say is that you might as well read the book. It's very similar to that. Like all Disney films, it has musical numbers, but there was one song sequence from The Green Fisherman called Sailing Over the Dogger Bank. Well, looks like it's the end of my story. Let this be a lesson to you, though. If you happen to come across an episode or film that scares the living shit out of you, I suggest that you look away. After all, there's no telling what inhuman scenes await human eyes. No mere man could ever withstand the dark, brutal, and graphic secrets behind Disney's nature. It's better left unsaid. <laughs>